guys. What's going on? It's Dave from the Meet Dave podcast. I'm coming to San Diego this weekend hosting the Egg Fest on Sunday. I think it starts at 10 a.m. If you want to come out and hang out, message me. I'll give you all the details or you can Google it. Uh, don't forget the end of this month. I'm going to be in uh, Chicago, Schomburg Improv. Uh, the dates on that are June 29th to July 1st. You get tickets at DaveWilliamson.com. Check out all my tour dates. Got a lot of different cities I'm hitting this year. Uh, Boise, Grand Rapids, Vegas, uh, Florida. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast uh, wherever you uh, listen to it. Uh, or if you're on YouTube, leave a comment. Uh, do the little thumbs up thing. I'm supposed to tell you that every time. I never remember. Uh, still sitting on cloud nine from going to Memphis in May a few weeks ago. It was a blast. I met so many cool people. Excited for our guest today. I met him at Memphis in May. He was actually the ribs champion 2021, which was the first time I went to Memphis in May. Um, a real interesting dude. And I'll just give you a little peek behind the curtain you're gonna see when we start the video right now that uh he's actually on location he's gonna tell us all about it uh he gets out of his truck does the whole interview and when he gets back to his truck at the end i just want you guys to know that he left the keys in the car in the truck and the truck running that whole time it's kind of funny to me awesome dude you guys are gonna love getting to know him please meet james cruz James, it looks like you're uh, looks like you're joining us from location somewhere. Did I catch you on? I know it's Memorial Day. Did I catch you in the middle of like cooking a big picnic or something? No, actually, you know what's funny is I haven't cooked anything yet today. You would think I'd take advantage of this holiday, but I haven't. It's been kind of a lazy day. Um, absolutely, because of Memorial Day, you know, I'm given the privilege to have a lazy day and and the ability to go to the gym and go work out. And then, you know, I've had have an interview with you guys because of the you know, the people that sacrifice their lives for us, for this country. So, uh, with that being said, I live in, I live in, in also I'm from Araby, Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, f for anyone local watching, they know it is uptown Chalmette. And speaking of Chalmette, I'm on site at the, uh, Chalmette battlefield, home of the battle of New Orleans, the last battle of the revolutionary war. So guess what we're going to do? We're about to step out of the truck and we're going to go on a little tour while we're talking. You go there you go, man. I love this. This let's, is like we're learning. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, normally we just teach people. We, we just teach people about barbecue. We're teaching people history today in your region. Oh, no, no. We're, we're going to talk some barbecue. We're going to talk some barbecue. Let me tell you, this, at this battle, we smoked the competition. Ha! That's cannon. a good pun. <laughs> All right. So, look. So, since I can't flip this camera around, I'm going to kind of do this. This is the battlefield. Okay? Uh -huh. That's where, that's where the, the war was held. The battle was held. Um, there's a monument, but well, let's do this. Let's go ahead and walk. Um, lock the truck, and then uh, as we as we walk and talk, I'll, I'll show you a couple of highlights along the way. There you go. Very cool. Um, so you you yeah, grew you cool grew walk. up in New Orleans, right? Like you you're pretty immersed in the the New Orleans history and culture and everything. I am. I am. See that that cannon back there? Yeah. There it is. I'm getting used to this camera. All right. So <clears throat> I said again, I'm from Araby, Louisiana. Um. See, Stock Yard landed up there. That's Araby's first settled name before it's called Araby. It was home of all of the, uh, the stockyards that all the um, animals and stuff had to be butchered and processed all throughout Louisiana down in uh, small Araby. And Araby covers about two by three miles. When it comes to the New Orleans area, when I walk out off my front porch, now I always tell people I could throw a baseball from my front porch and actually hit New Orleans because my neighbor across the street, their back fence is Orleans Parish, right? Until I said, well, you know what? If I cover that today during this interview, I looked over. I was like, well, that, ba that ball's going to have to bounce a couple times because <laughs> I've been kind of over overstretching that a little bit. I probably can't reach it on the fly. But, you know, on a on some uh, concrete, I could reach it with a baseball. Yeah, or maybe just hit hit a golf ball. So, we'll, we'll change it to you can hit a golf look. ball to New Orleans. There's the, there's the Shelmet Monument. Um. But yes, yeah, so it's a very historic uh, spot right here that we're at. It's where uh, Jean Lafitte, he fought off the uh, British here. Um, there's a lot of people visiting today too as well. But this is, a, uh, this is a place for people to come run around the battlefield. There's a track. You can ride your bike. You can drive around it. Things like that. And, you know, it's a kind of cool place. So with that being said, like I said, I'm from the New Orleans area. Uh, in St. Bernard Parish, we have parishes in Louisiana. Everywhere else has counties. Uh, I guess in other countries, they have villages and providences and 
whatever else they have there. No one else has parishes. Yeah, I remember that um, TV show with Steven Seagal, and he was like a, a deputy, and he could do, you know, he said, this the so-and-so parish, Louisiana. Okay, so lo, uh, fun fact about Steven Seagal. <laughs> I was in a charity event probably 12 years ago, and he was a – I'm going to go ahead and say it. It's called Mr. Legs, right? It was a charity event to raise money. I'm on stage on a runway with shorts to show my legs, wearing a costume. Atta boy. And I, dressed as cu- and I dressed as Cupid doing the Cupid shuffle. <laughs> and, I shot an arrow, and I shot an arrow at Steven Seagal. <laughs> he, he, was, he wasn't too happy about it. He doesn't it. seem like he has a sense of humor about something like that. <laughs> no, man. No, not at all. So He does seem like he's eaten a lot of barbecue the past few decades, though. Oh, yes. Uh, probably... And he's probably dipped in. He's probably dipped whatever he was uh, eating in gravy. <laughs> yeah, because um, <laughs> there is a root down here. <laughs> so we're gonna go find a place to uh, stop. In fact, you know what? Yeah, can you see? Again, I can't flip the camera around, but you can see that uh, house. Where's that? Where's the camera? That house back there. We're yeah. gonna sit on the porch. There That's you where go. We're gonna sit. I like it. <clears throat> this is our. Yeah, there's a th- lot of people. This is our first interview uh, while being taken on a field trip. I like it. Yeah. Hey, and so being probably – oh, they're giving a tour. So we're going to – can you hear me clearly? Yeah, you're good, man. All right, good. I'm going to walk by these people because I don't want to interrupt them. They don't want to hear, they don't want to hear me talk about barbecue. So <laughs> I I'm bet gonna go they around. do. I yeah, bet. so what's crazy, what's crazy is uh, – let's talk about barbecue for a second. This is a barbecue show. Yeah. You know, some Louisiana's first and only ever barbecue world champion from Memphis and May. And with that being said, 2021, said, correct? 2021. 21, yes. Yeah. So I was top three in the world. Uh, last three Memphis and Mays, except for this year, I finished 14th. But hell, I'll take 14th. That's yeah. uh, it's the world, right? 100%. So, uh, so for a five-year stretch, I was 12th, third, first, second, 14th. Not a bad stretch. And I've told people before about the New Orleans area. You know, we're, we're Louisiana in general. We've always been an outdoor cooking state. And we haven't specifically barbecued, but let me tell you something. We're the, in the world is there. We're the food capital of the world. Um, at some point, we were going to figure it out. And when we did, there wasn't gonna, no one's going to stop us. We're going to bring, like, balanced flavor. Um, everybody thinks we're just going to bring stuff that's going to burn your face off. That's not true. When I'm, when I'm presenting to judges <clears throat> at Memphis and Maine, I, bring, I preach balance. So with that being said, I wore a T-shirt today that... <laughs> That uh, represents our mindset here. New Orleans versus all y'all. Yeah, there you go. I like it. <laughs> we're coming, man. Yeah. So, lot, lot anyway, of, but Dave, we're, a lot, lot, lot of civic Dave, pride in New Orleans for sure. Uh, I grew up in Miami, and we always have that same chip on our shoulder too, man. It's Miami versus the world for sure. You have to be. Now, when we, me and you met, we, uh, we talked about a specific place in Miami that I can't wait to go back. It's a little hole in the wall Cuban restaurant and. And I had one of the best pork dishes I've ever, ever had in my life at that place. It's called El Metro Restaurante, I think it was. Yeah. And well, Hialeah? Hialeah? I might get beat up on that pronunciation. Hialeah. Hialeah. Yeah. Hialeah is how the mm-hmm. gringos say it. Um, it's true. Wherever <laughs> you're from obviously finds its way into your food influences and everything. I've said over and over again on this podcast that um, my earliest real introduction to barbecue was uh, my Cuban friends going over their house for holidays and having uh, a whole hog out of the La Caja China boxes. And um, uh-huh. I'm sure that, you know, you growing up in Louisiana, like you said, it finds its way into your cooking. So when you're cooking somewhere like um, Memphis and May and you're and you're trying to find that balance you're talking about, are you uh-huh. specifically putting something that's uh, got like some New Orleans roots like into your recipe, into your process? You know, are you putting some Cajun seasoning in there or anything like that? Or it's just your experiences you're putting into it? No, I do. I do do a little bit. Hey, how's it going? Um, I do a little bit. Okay, so again, I'm not, I'm not so much um, seasoning my ribs with crawfish boil. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay, I have my own products called Stockyard Landing. Um, I do bring a lot of herbs and spices, and, and in Cajun cooking, like I said, we yeah we use cayenne and things like that, but we don't bring a ton of heat. If that makes sense. We bring a lot of balance and flavor. Obviously. We um, we have our trinity, which is onions, bell pepper, celery. The whole of trinity or the pope, you add garlic. Well, all four of those are in my rubs, okay? They're all four definitely in my chop house rub, um, which is my steak, brisket, chop, burger seasoning. With that being said, my other two that I use, my all-around and my grand champ, 
they bring a lot of flavor. And like, again, Cajun cooking is flavor, not spice. And that's you know, um, and it's just one of those things where that's what I that's what I do. That's what I preach to the judges. Um, I'm not I'm not trying to burn your face off. It's it's actually mild in heat, you know. It's but I bring or I bring a lot. Okay, we're at a stopping point now. There you as go. As far as uh, as far as walking, so look, the backdrop that is the battlefield right there. Uh, I guess you can see where I'm at, right? Yeah, no, I can see it clearly. And uh, and we're at the we're at a house that was built on this thing. It was uh, it wasn't a plantation, so I'm uh, <laughs> I'm not supporting that right now. You're not going down podcast, that road. <laughs> no, we're not. But no, this is this is a house that was built for uh, generals and things like that. So. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, this is who I am. This is where I'm from. Um, highly competitive, um, but I do represent, you know, my area. You know, and I'm proud to be from here. Uh, and also, we have uh, bugs everywhere, so they're trying to be involved as well. Yeah. Once again, being from uh, Florida, I completely understand that. Um, mm-hmm. Well, so I like I like the before we started recording, you brought up the parallel of you know it's Memorial Day. Usually, like, let me let me record from the battlefield, show you guys some of the region, and it's fitting because you've been in a lot of battles yourself. Uh, you're a competitive guy. You've been, uh, like you said, the 2021 Memphis and May Ribs champ. Uh, you've finished um, uh, up at the top at the World Food Championships, the Jack Daniels uh, World Championships Invitational, um, and then Hawks for the cause. The Royal. Yeah, uh, the Royal. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure the list goes on and on. Uh, let's talk about hogs for the cause for a second, because I've never been, and everyone says that that's the spot to go. That's the one, the one thing I got to put on my bucket list. It's not already there. Uh, talk about hogs for the cause a little bit there in new Orleans. All right. So hogs for the cause, it is one of the biggest, uh, I'm gonna call it barbecue events in the country. Uh, this year they finally decided to start, to start putting a cap on teams. I think we're around like 96 teams. Mm -hmm. Um, we've gotten to over a hundred before it is NBN judged. But it's not fully sanctioned. It's only being scheduled as a specialty event. But besides the barbecue, besides cooking, uh, you know, ribs, shoulder, whole hog, and probably six or seven other ancillary categories and pork categories, the main focus of Hawks for the Cause is to raise money for kids who are battling pediatric brain cancer. And for me, it hits personal for me. Uh, cancer runs in my family. Um, in any form of cancer, I, I'm, I'll be 100%, you know, on the battle lines with these guys to try to do whatever we can possible, raise money. Um, I've stopped, I, cooking a piece of meat on a grill does not cure cancer. Uh, it never will. Um, I've always said if, if I can give up barbecue and just cook broccoli the rest of my life and it cured some form of cancer, I would do it. I'd become a broccoli world champion, but <laughs> I would try to do it. Um, but no, it's, it's such a good event. It's, it's considered probably the best food festival in the New Orleans area because all 95 teams 96 teams, unlike most competitions where you have your pit master, like myself and my team, and we're just focusing on meat into a white box, every team also sells to the public, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, so for me, like, I can't, I can't sit there and cook a bunch of public food, with, whether it be a griddle or a rotisserie or whatever. So I have two parts of my team. I run my competition guys, and we keep two separate kitchens. Then I have my other crew of people, and they're – you know, we've had like Caden Blake, who is, I mean, a phenomenal kid. He's going through some medical issues right now. He's on my team. Stale Crackers on my team. Uh, Mark Lambert's on my team. These are all guys who all want to contribute. Everybody puts their egos and pride aside because we're all trying to raise money for these kids. And like my front of house, dude, you want to, you would want to film a show just on them because, like, look, Caden. Caden was in there running a griddle. We're doing a whole hog fried rice for the public. So once I take my hog off the smoker, which is a Holy City Hogs uh, Tank Jackson specialty. I take the pork off that hog, all the cuts that I need that are required for uh, my entry. I turn it in, and the rest of it goes to front of house. And then they take it, and they this year they they did a whole hog fried rice, uh, along with you know some quesadillas and some other specialty items. Uh, I let them handle everything. Last year we had stale cracker make a thirty gallon pot of whole hog uh, pastalaya, which that's fun. Um, yeah. But with that being said, I'm trying to position this. Oh, right, there we go. There we go. Now I'm centered. Um, <laughs> With that being said, I look over those guys. I'm super driven, super focused, and it's like I've got this this laser uh, focus on my boxes, right? I'm still having a good time, but I look over at my front of house, and those dudes over there are high-fiving each other, fist bumping, dancing, doing shots, 
they're all written and drinking beer. They're all having a good time. Music's playing. Uh, there's two music stages at the event itself with, with stage, you know, uh, bands going on all day long. Then, then comes awards. It is the most fun awards you'll ever go to in any barbecue event in the entire world. It'll last a couple hours, but let me tell you something. The three guys on stage, you have Zandy, Renee, and Becker. They're up there. Um, you know, they're cutting up the entire time. They're announcing all the teams up there. And there's two parts to this to awards that that uh, well, actually two parts to the event that really hit home to you. Um, again, we've got like my team is comprised of you know a couple world champions, right? Doesn't matter. We're cooking food for these kids, for the public to raise money for these kids. So at the coach meeting, a lot of times they'll take one of the uh, patients and their family, and you have all the guys in there along with their teammates sitting in at, in, at the coach meeting while Melzy Wilson, who's to run Memphis May uh, judging. Uh, yeah, she goes uh, she goes over all the rules and everything, and then they bring up the kid and, and one of the patients and one of the family members. And and Dave, look, I've never been a stand-up comedian, you know, I've never performed in front of a live crowd. Yeah. I, I do a lot of dad jokes and a lot of puns, and, and I'm one of those people. <laughs> so I'm like I. a prof- <laughs> I'm a professional people watcher, but at yeah. the same time, you have a little bit of a script, all right? And you're in, you're already prepared. <laughs> you put this pa- this parent in front of a crowd of 200 people, and you have to just spill your heart out to these people, like like what Hogs for the Cause means to them, and and their appreciation for what we're doing to them. I'm gonna tell you something right now. I don't care how big and bad and tough you are in that crowd. There's a lot of tough guys in barbecue, right? Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of rough necks, especially last year. There was not a dry eye in the entire crowd <clears throat> because it kind of brings home what, what we are all there to do. We all have a job to do. It's our responsibility to raise money for these kids. And, uh, you know, it's kind of even hard for me to even talk about it now, but, yeah. you know, it's, you know, like I said, cancer runs in my family. I've got a little boy, and it's kind of he's three and a half, and it's like I don't know how I'd ever react, you know? Yeah. Well, that's what, that being, <laughs> that's what barbecue is all that, about, man, is it's a, a barbecue is yeah. an amazing community. It's it's why I fall Dude. in love with uh, with this barbecue community and uh, why I keep trying to find different ways to get involved and uh, meet people like you. And Dude. and uh, you, know, I'll tell you what, uh, there's very few people that I've met or hung out with in the barbecue community or just even podcasted with that. I didn't feel like we were best buds when it was all said and done, man. You know, it's like, yeah. it's really, it's a, it's something that, that, uh, brings special people together. Yeah. And, uh, hey. and, and it's cool that you guys are using it for, um, you know, a very specific cause <clears throat> that, uh, changes right. people's lives. And, and look, and look, one more thing about, I'm gonna tell you this, the other part about the awards. Okay. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll wrap up the hogs for the cause talk. When you had awards, they start going over the numbers, amount of money that the the higher raising teams, you know, higher fundraising teams raised, and that's another one that hits you too because it's kind of like you do these fundraisers all throughout the year. Um, and, and what I'll do is I don't know if you put like description where to uh, where to send money, but I'll, I'll give you some links after we get off. Sure, yeah, but, we can do that. Um, you start hearing money raised for all these people, and there's teams out there that look have never won a barbecue award in their life, but it doesn't matter; they're on the same level as us that weekend. You st- so collectively this year we raised three point six million dollars for these kids. Wow! All these teams. So, it, trust me, it's it's a team. And guess, and guess what? I'm gonna go ahead on air right now. I don't know when you fa- you plan on publishing this, but Dave, you're you've got the official invite to be part of Team Fire and Spice next year at Hogs for the Cause. Boom! Consider me there, buddy. Uh, I don't and, know what my calendar and, looks like, but I'm gonna make sure that I can uh, be there because I've heard the Hogs for the Cause is the event you got to get to. So I'm gonna get there. It doesn't matter. Go to store, buy some whiteout. Put it on that weekend and fill in <laughs> HTFC24, okay? Well, that's exactly H-F-T-C. why. I, look, I, I, I'm i still a paper calendar guy. And that's why, that's why I use pencil, buddy, because when I get an offer like that, I got to erase whatever's on that date, and I'm going to be there. Yeah. So it's the only event that I call – I have a team that – I lead a team called Fire and Spice because the two biggest sponsors of the company that I work for. So most people don't do, know what I do for a day job. Yeah. I'm the national sales manager for Deep South Blenders. So I'm a basically a season, bulk spice and seasoning co-packer. So we've got their sponsor along with Louisiana Pepper Exchange, the other sponsor. Yeah. And then, you know, we got a, a lot of guys together. We just call it, it's a, the only event I do all year long where we're named Fire and Spice. So I'll uh, give me your address. I'll send you the official hat. You have to wear it for at least one podcast. 100%. Yeah, but yeah, you're, you're a member. You're a member. Come hang out with us. Um, and then at Memphis in May, you were cooking uh, with Bluff City Smokers, right? That was the team yes. you're on there? Yeah. So that's a team that recruited me back in 2018. Um, I got the invite about a month before to say, hey, can you come cook for us? Sure. And um, I was like, I'm going to just crack the top 40 with no preparation going into it. And we finished 12th. 
There you go. So and then we finaled the next three years straight, and we finished, like I said, third, won a world championship, and then I was a runner-up last year. And then this year, we just finished 14th. One of my one of my blind judges kind of dinged me, but, like, I'm a sports fan. I never say – I always say you never put the game in, in the hands of the referees, yeah. so I'm not going to blame the judge. I mean, there's probably something off about my box this year. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it. We'll correct it for next year and, and then uh, try to be back on stage again. Well, man, it's sometimes the difference between first place and 14th place is, like, 0.023%. It's really tight. That's the exact number that I missed by. See? <laughs> I'm, the I'm, exact number, Dave. I'm like Rain Man. I think you must have told me yeah. that. I remembered it. Um, and yeah. you brought up too, man, people don't realize, but most of these uh, barbecue, you know, you look online, you see it advertised, it's a barbecue festival. So a lot of people go and they buy a ticket to go and they think they're going to eat just a ton of barbecue. People aren't there to nope. feed you. They're there to compete. So yep. like I got to eat That'll a lot help. of barbecue because I walk around, I mingle, I have friends there and uh, I, I, I work my way into the VIP tent. I walk my way over to this tent. They're like, Dave, try this for us. Let you know. But the average person who walks in there. You're just watching people cook for the most part, going to demos. Maybe there's like some, yeah. there, there are a couple, um, you know, uh, there was like corn dogs being sold, stuff like that. But you're just going to be I smelling, you're going to be smelling a lot of good food, not necessarily getting access to it. So that's yep. cool that so, at, at Hogs of the Cost, people can go there and, and stuff themselves. Absolutely. Do yeah. you try, do we, when you talk about you're the food capital of the world, you don't think some of these people, it's their opportunity to shine for the public? And yeah. you get chef driven boots. I mean, dude, they're going all out. They're not selling. You're not going there and buying. If you buy a corn dog, it's probably like a pork belly corn dog or something. Yeah. You know, um, it, it's, it's a good time, man. It's, uh, you've got to make it. It's always the last weekend of March, first weekend of April. I think next year, that Saturday could be April 2nd. Yeah. So let's just that weekend, whatever that Friday, Saturday is, um, just be prepared to come in town from, Thursday to Sunday. Uh, you got it, man. Consider me there. So, you know, uh -huh. you're talking about this competitive approach, you know, the, being a sports fan and not blaming the refs and all that kind of the judges. So what what's the emotions? When I met you and we had a drink on um, Sunday night, I think it was, uh, after the festival, you, you seemed like um, like it was you were celebrating the weekend, but it probably taken a toll because, I mean, that's three days of just going hard, cooking, and having, you know, yourself, your, your passion – your hard work, you know, physically and emotionally judged by basically a bite, right? So just talk about yeah, that, that, like that, that was, roller coaster. That was uh, Saturday night because I had I had to drive out on Sunday. Oh, but that's right, that's right. No, it, it is. I, I usually come in on Tuesday, and I stay Tuesday to Sunday. And um, when I come in on Tuesday, it's just unload a few things. Um, then usually go to dinner with whatever whatever other guys are in town. And then Wednesday we start. We start really cooking for the uh our party because our team is is a notorious party team yeah <laughs> so the guys that i bring in town everybody on my team has is an award-winning pit master at some level um <clears throat> so all the guys on our team they all know too they have a role that you know we've got to cook some stuff whether it be some pork some ribs some sides for these party people at night because these guys are, are covering uh the bill for us and for all these people to be yeah. in there sponsors everybody and, and look it's a good time and then as the week goes on, you start hitting your ancillary. You start hitting, you know, sauce categories and beef, exotic, seafood, um, poultry, uh, turkey, all of them. And so what I do is I give all the ancillaries to my guys uh, because each ancillary is kind of a, a little bit of a low-end world championship. And it's my appreciation. You guys, you know, have taken time off of work to come help me out. And, and I, I'm, you know what? It's us. Help us out. You know, yeah. I've always used a team approach to things. Uh, yeah, my name is on there as the head cook, pit master, and all that stuff. And but at the end of the day, I, I couldn't do it without these guys, and they all know that, and um, they all come in. And, and if you follow me on social media, uh, during that time, I was posting stories. Uh, I've had so many people say that they would want to be part of our team because we have fun. Uh, yeah. Where some teams are taking, you know, let, let's say their poultry box, and they're like, all right, got to go run it to the judges, so I'm going to go bring it to the booth. No, we do an almost professional wrestling intro to each cook as they're leaving <laughs> our booth. And, uh, I saw and I, that. I, I, what, I saw that on your social yeah, media. Yeah. And what I do is I'll get I'll get each one of the team members to be the announcer for another team member. Yeah. And you got guys look, who are completely sometimes shelled up. I'm like, dude, you got to do it. Come on, <laughs> let's break this shell. Get out there and do it. And uh, it's it's dude, it's fun. And it's like it's that's just some of the little things that we do. Um, and then on Friday, Friday is an early night for us. But Friday is a little bit of a spectacle because uh, I'm 
I'm considered the rib guy, right? And everybody wants to see me trim ribs on Friday. So I used to barricade it off. It takes me about two or three hours, my entire tr- uh, rib trimming process. <clears throat> and this is after they've come from Compar Duroc, go to a butcher, get trimmed down one time, and then I take them again. But during that time, it's kind of like, you know, the DJ's playing. Uh, I've got videos of where we panned across the booth and look at my team. Dude, they're all just having fun. Yeah. It's We're about to wrap up the week, a lot of hard work. Everybody traveled in and did some cooking, and then everybody's dancing and cutting up. And then we all leave early that night, and then we, we show up, you know, 5 o'clock the next morning and uh, get to work for one last day. So, so how, it's kind of like that Friday night's our happy hour to, yeah. to kind of let loose a little bit. And then how many, so how many racks of ribs will you cook to find that perfect turn in box? Uh, 20. So you'll cook 20 and then you'll sit and you'll look and you go, this is the one, this is so the rack. I, I order 24 and, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of note taking right here. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's coming at me. Everybody yeah. comes after me for ribs every year. Hey, I order 20, I order 24, but I cook 20. The other four, and Mr. Jim Compart, your ribs are the best in the world, but four of them do hit the trash. They just yeah. don't make the team. Uh, I'm not going to cook four extra racks just to for us to snack on them. Um, but I cook 20, and I, I find the best 20 racks possible. And what I do is I trim them all to where I want each one of them, in my mind, to be world championship quality. And it's a spectacle. I mean, it's there's a lot of work into it. Um, I've had a lot of people come up to me and say they've never seen somebody put that much work into a rack of ribs. I'm like, dude, it's ribs. I'm here. I'm six hours from home. Why wouldn't I want to put the extra effort in to to – doing something to be successful so and that's my thing and, and obviously the the results have shown themselves but that's all part of effort and work that goes into it and uh but uh, yeah i cooked 20 racks and and you brought up the word perfect box okay i'll tell you one thing about me that I, I've, I've always said i've never in my life ever cooked a perfect rack of ribs <laughs> uh and hopefully i never do the reason i'm gonna keep chasing it the moment i think that i cooked the perfect rack of ribs or the perfect brisket or perfect hog or whatever i what am I shooting for after that point? At that point, you know what I mean? Because if it's perfect, you can't. There's nothing to shoot for. I mean, so I'm a goal setter. So for me, it's like if I'm going to keep chasing that. Yeah, I've cooked some really, really good ribs, some really good whole hog. Because I won the whole hog national championship in 2020. Yeah. <clears throat> and even then, I was like, it's pretty good. And you could ask any guy on my team. I spit out ribs every time on a Saturday morning when I'm building a box. I'm like, yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> and a lot of times they say they love it when they say they, they see me saying that rib is terrible yeah. because it's usually a good sign. But I'm I'm my biggest critic, and I'll never say that I cooked the perfect rack of ribs. And now I don't want to say that for people. You know, I cater maybe a couple times a year. So hey, any catered customers out there, yeah. it's perfect for you. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, look, man, you, you got to keep pushing yourself, right? Like that's that's the, the that's the sign of a champion. What? Um, yes, so sir. you made a comment earlier about you know the judge and the the uh, the blind box and everything like that. So for people that don't know, just explain the process of like uh, how those ribs actually do get judged. All right. So the judging process, I'm still I'm still getting used to this this camera angle. But anyway, you um, look great, buddy. Oh uh, no, no, you look great. Ah. So. Uh, so the judging process, we cook the racks of ribs, and then you have to pick your best ribs for the blind box, because that's the that's the biggest way to score it there is blind, and it's strictly about uh, flavor, texture, moisture, presentation, things like that. Uh, as soon as you turn your blind box in, you're visited by a judge, an on-site judge, and you have a minimum of 10 minutes, a maximum of 15 minutes to, you know, put on the dog and pony show. I mean, again, let's go back to like social. If you follow me on social media, you don't see me bragging about myself, pat myself on the back on a regular basis. I'm a humble and modest guy, but that part right there, you have to kind of turn it on a little bit because this judge right here wants to hear from somebody who cooked, in their mind, the best rack of ribs or the best shoulder, the best hog in the entire uh, world. So, one way of doing that is not only cook the best thing in the world, right? You also have to explain your process. You know, I have to tell them how I source the ribs, uh, what was my trimming process, my cooking process. You bring them onto the trailer, you show them the smoker, you, you talk about the tra- the smoker a little bit. Uh, when it comes time to feeding them, you sit them down at the table. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail, everything we do for these judges at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, look, the only, the only happy ending is they had some good ribs in their mouth. <laughs> but, <laughs> Um, when they leave there, they've got to go, they got to leave there with the perception that like, all right, these guys absolutely have, absolutely have the best barbecue in the world. And you've got to do it all within you, 15 minutes is a lot. You know I mean? I'm sure when you're on stage, 15 minutes just flies by, Yeah. you know, 
but it's a minimum 10, maximum 15. So you have a timekeeper kind of giving you time signals, things like that. <clears throat> and everybody on the team has a title, has a position, has their role in some presentation. So we, we've got a really good presentation. We're kind of a finely tuned machine. And uh, once you're done with that first judge, <clears throat> everyone runs inside, you do a very quick reset, and then you have another judge. And then another one after that. So now you have three judges. So now you've been judged four times. Uh, blind box is judged by anywhere from four to six judges <clears throat> inside the judge intent. You have three on-site judges. And the key, which you want to earn from the uh, on-site judges, you want to get their overall 10. So let's say me and you, and, and each judge only judges three teams. Let's say me and you are competing against each other. Um, and then there's, I don't know, Bob Smith. He's the third team. So this judge goes and judges all three of us. And might look at your ribs, might look at mine, and like, dude, they're both spot on, perfect, right? And you'll get tens on, you know, your presentation, your booth and area appearance, your flavor, all that stuff. But then when it comes to overall, they can't give us both tens. You, they can only give one of their three teams a ten. Um, and then the the next person, if they're if it's splitting hairs, or if, if the judge still thinks it's a tie, you still can't give a ten. That next that next uh, cook gets probably a nine point nine nine. And that's, that's still a huge difference. Um, so, you know, for us, it's kind of like we try to get that, that judge's overall 10 every single time, along with locking in 10s across the board on all the other uh, presentation criteria. Uh, with all that being said, yeah. there's one more level of judges. So now they're going to take the three highest scores from blind to from on-site, tally them up, and those three teams make finals in each category. So now you have nine finalists. You have uh, three rib, three shoulder, three hog. And then a golf cart comes by, and if that golf cart comes by with your ambassador on it, you got a piece of paper, it's, it's cause for celebration. You yeah. just made finals, which is, you're, you know, you are now guaranteed top three in the world. And uh, like I said, we were lucky enough to have that golf cart stop us the previous three years. Um, they didn't stop this year. They kept driving by, but, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where if they stop by, now you have, you know, up to an hour to completely reset and this is where you want to talk about barbecue community. Uh, your booth might be just very basic and, you know, you have a flower, little bush here or there or <laughs> table setting, yeah. whatever, right? The teams around you will start bringing you all their stuff. It could be a rug. It could be plate dinnerware. They want to help you out and make your booth the best one and your whole presentation the best one out of the three other teams you're being judged against. Actually, yeah. out of the eight other teams you're being judged against because now in finals – you're not only being judged against the other two rib teams, you're being judged against the other eight teams overall for, for the overall finish. And then within ribs, you know, whoever has the highest score out of the three rib teams is the rib world champion yeah. or the shoulder world champion or the hog world champion. And then, and then they tally up overall after that. So it's, uh, you could potentially do almost an hour's worth of on-site presentation. Yeah, I walked by. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the team that ended up winning. Uh, ended up winning overall. Uh, I walked. Mm -hmm. I walked by them uh, as the judges were sitting there, and uh, people had set up chairs to watch. And it was like really. T it was the most tense moment I'd seen the whole weekend uh, yeah. at any point, where they were just there giving their presentation, and the judges were sitting. It felt like one of those like dog competitions or whatever, where you know everyone's <laughs> just. Had well, the dogs real, like this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Real tense moment. Yeah, it's, but, it's, that's what it is. But it's it's really it was really incredible to be there, and you know, after so many different teams, I'd got either you know they're old friends of mine or new friends or whatever, and I know what they've put into the weekend. That I mean, I can't describe that moment where the the people were walking around because first they they make one round giving out the first through third place, right? So then if you kind of know that those have already been given out, you're like, oh, man, that sucks. We didn't get first or third, but, you know, that's hard. We probably still will hopefully get fourth to tenth. And then you're, like, sitting there and you're on needles again, hoping that they come through and you get fourth to tenth, right? And then and then it's just, like, levels of, like, uh, anticipation, I guess, you know, while oh, you're emotionally it, ex exhausted. <laughs> it makes it even worse when there's a delay. Yeah. Because, so the year I won it, I had a whole rib for over eight hours. I was, was wondering. I didn't want to bring that up because I know a lot of people were <laughs> upset about it. But I, I was doing the math in my head. That's the only other time I've been to Memphis in May. And they had a huge problem with the judges on ribs, right? And it took them forever yep. to come out and judge everybody. So my ribs came off the smoker at that year, roughly 1030, 1045, 1015, somewhere around there, right? Uh, middle of the 10 o'clock hour. Uh, we made finals. And by the time I got the final certificate, my finals presentation was at 7:10 at night. 
Oof. And uh, yeah, but we we uh, we killed it that day. You, so you pulled it, it out. worked out for us. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, I mean, barbecue is about the obstacles and overcoming whatever, you know, the elements or, you know, things throw at you. So that was a real test in that. <laughs> yeah. And you, you produce championship ribs uh, the, the, despite the display, uh, the delay. That's great, man. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've mentioned a couple times about your smokers. Uh, t- tell us about them. What what uh, what are you cooking on at those competitions? Yeah, uh, it for me it depends. I'm, I'm gonna readjust this thing here because uh, see so we can get this right. There, here we go. That's more comfortable. There you go. Um, am I looking right? Yeah, there we go. So for me, it is. It depends on kind of competition I'm, I'm at. Um, it, at Memphis and May, I'm cooking on the Backwoods Professional, which is a tall water cooker, cabin-style smoker. Uh, some of the other contests, like in Louisiana, we have our own section of body called BCA, which is the Barbecue Competitors Alliance, where you're turning in uh, half chicken, ribs, and brisket. And then, you know, there, you, there's no on-site judge. There's no garnish in the box. It's a piece of foil. And... Um, so I don't have to cook a ton of meat. You know, I'm you turning in a fully jointed half chicken. So I'm bringing one chicken out there and cooking two halves. Ribs, you have to turn in seven bones. So I'm bringing three racks of ribs. So I need a small smoker for that. Brisket, I've cooked something as small as a three pound flat to turn in seven slices. Mm. <clears throat> so with that being said, at a competition like that, I'm probably cooking on like a drum. Uh, I do like backwoods. So I've got a smaller backwoods smoker as well. So I've got you know three backwoods smokers. Um, and you know i'll cook that on there and then chicken i go hot and fast so a lot of times i'll cook like on an m grill like an m16 or now the new m80 which i'm about to do some content on that thing i just unboxed it that thing is i think it's clean uh you do kcbs you, you got to bring a little bit extra equipment now you got four pieces of meat um went down to florida and uh won a contest down there in the fba and that's another one where it's uh chicken ribs pork brisket so you got to kind of like set your smokers up but i've got 20 three smokers and grills uh not every one of them is up for competition my my hog my whole hog smoker is a custom built um uh, deep south smokers gravity feed uh so randall bowman he built me something that's you know their their smokers are typically 24 inches deep by whatever the length is i've got a gc60 that's 30 inches deep with a hog rack in it so that's something i'll do whole hog on or do some catering on it or you know that's one that you'll see at hogs for the cause next year yeah um but yeah, it, it honestly depends on the the style of the contest, uh, the meats required, and you know y- your style, your techniques. But for me, I'm I'm super efficient, um, so I need stuff that's gonna be super efficient. Now, I love I love the old school, you know, throw throw a stick in the firebox offset, and that's the one you want to sit around, have a beer, and, and you know, meet you hang out all day. And we got 12 to 15 hours to cook a brisket because we're not rushed by anything. But they're tough to compete on because. One of the biggest things in competition, you want to get some sleep. Yeah. Now, the the trend has been super hot and fast where you can sleep all night, wake up at, you know, four to six in the morning and just blast some meat out real quick and then you can be successful. I'm more of a moderate speed. I don't go super low and slow. Um, on smoking, 250 is my wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, Brisket, gotta go, I'll go a little higher than that. Chicken, I go higher than that as well. But uh, for the most part, though, I mean, I'm kind of a traditionalist when it comes to temperatures. So I like to be somewhere in that middle range. You know, as long as I'm rendering fat, breaking down muscle proteins, things like that, that's, that's all that matters. It depends on how you get there. And, and I've always, when I teach barbecue classes, I've always explained to people, you can cook good barbecue at, it, at almost any temperature, you know, from 200 to 400. It doesn't matter. You got to ask yourself, how good are you with stopping, you know, <laughs> stopping the cooking process? Because... If I was to say, if I was to go over here to the uh, the concrete little track around this battlefield, and you were tell me, James, <clears throat> you got to run 1,000 feet, sprint it out, go as fast as you can, but you got to stop 10 feet after that finish line. Can you do it? Probably not. Okay. If you would tell me that, James, I go walk that 1,000 feet and stop within 10 minutes. Can you do it? Yes, I can. Well. Therm- thermodynamics work the same way, you know, so you have momentum and heat. So the, hot, the hotter and faster you cook, the, the smaller window you have of being done perfectly. So mm-hmm. you got to, I mean, if you're experienced, you can do it. I would say for new guys, stick to a little bit lower and slower because your window of being done perfect is a little bit bigger now, you know, so that your stopping point is bigger. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, the biggest thing I tell for new people, cook cook what you know and cook on the equipment that you know as well 
don't go out and buy a big expensive smoker because you see everybody else using it on the circuit and you don't know how to use it. If if your thing is a, a Brinkman offset smoker that you got from Kmart 22 years ago, do a cook on it. You know, and eventually nail your process and then start upgrading equipment. You know, it's, get you some sleep, uh, get you some cleaner burning fires and, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, so everything I cook on is, is for the most part, uh, ranges from traditional to super efficient. Yeah. That, look, I tell my wife, that's why I have to have so many different smokers. You never know which <laughs> tool is going to be the right one for the job. Sometimes I want I mean, to light a fire and have everyone sit around and, and enjoy the process. Sometimes I need to throw yep. a brisket in the pellet smoker and then I can get some sleep that night without worrying about the house uh, burning down. Like, you know? like right now, me, me and you are talking. We don't have two solo cups and a string, do we? <laughs> so, no. you know, technology is in barbecue. That's it. That's it. And I'm going to go home so. and fire up probably both of, uh, both, both, uh, instant. I'm going to fire up my pellet and my offset when I get home. Cause I'm cooking a bunch of stuff for, uh, for a little watch party tonight for, for the basketball game. Yeah. I, I've got, I've got a couple pellet smokers and I, you know, they're fine. Um, every smoker has, it has its role and every smoker or grill has, they bring something different to the table. There's, I guess I've never cooked a perfect piece of barbecue. I, there's not a perfect piece of equipment out there. Yeah. Sorry, sponsors, but there's not a perfect piece of equipment that just does everything. <laughs> unless they give and you, all, uh, unless they really come to the table with more money, then we'll go ahead and lie and say it is. <laughs> no, they look. No, they they know that. Yeah. They know that you know the the guys building the offsets. They're not they're not in the business for you know building a twelve inch twelve inch round charcoal grill. No, they're going to tell you, oh, I can build that for you. Um, but you know, it's everybody. Everybody has a role. Everybody has has their niche, and you know, you gotta you gotta live and die by it. Well, I'll tell you what, man. Next, I know that the process is different for um, for competition versus just you know when you're cooking for your buddies at your house. But next time yep. when we're hanging out, I want to shoot a video of you trimming your ribs because uh, if you're that meticulous about it and you have that much of a process, that's a question I get all the time. Because you know people who are just backyard warriors, like you know they know about the membrane and they struggle with it sometimes. But you know an overall trim on a ribs, I think would be a really interesting <clears throat> thing to show people. Well, this this is what we could do. Now that you're a member of Fire and Spice, my ribs and everything will be trimmed before I even get there, but I'll save one rack and we'll do some content. We'll, we'll share some ribs. Um, or I'll just do a video, you know, the next few weeks and I'll do a collab with you and say, look, this is, this is how I trim ribs. And it could be St. Louis or Baby Backs. Um, you know, for, for the backyard cook, we'll start with that and then we'll work our way to competition. Perfect. We'll go from backyard cook to restaurant trim to competition. I love that. I think that's a great idea. Uh, and you know what? I, I think we're going to be buddies. I think we're going to hang out a bunch. But no matter yeah. what, no matter what fun we have and what we do, I'll always remember you as the dude I had a drink with at the bar when a crazy guy was trying to talk to us and get to know. Us. <laughs> you remember, I had no idea. Wait, it, it gets you. Look, I don't remember. And he had some fake accent too. Yeah, he was some over the top. He he tried, and then look, I, I don't. I'm not even going. I'm not even. Gonna, I'm not even going to describe him because whatever. <laughs> But he came with the most over-the-top, car- cartoonish, hillbilly <laughs> accent I've ever heard in my life. And you know what I'm talking about. And you looked at him like, nope, doesn't fit <laughs> he at was, all. He was like an alien that was trying to pretend like he was a human for the first time. It was like, hello, so, fellow bar patrons. I am yeah. overhearing your conversation. Uh, sounds like wild times right over in. here, huh, guys? Uh, pal, yeah. let's be pals. And we're like, bro, do you know how to have, like, you, this is the most <laughs> awkward conversation. Wait, so right before that, my friend Dan that I was with, he's one of yeah. the guys on my team. We went to dinner at a uh, little Canadian restaurant called um, the Kooky Canuck, I think, in downtown Memphis. Yeah. So we're sitting at the bar eating, just minding our business, actually talking to the owner and stuff. This homeless guy walks up behind us. And look, in New Orleans, we get a lot of homeless people. They come up and, and you know, they'll ask for money or ask food, whatever, right? This guy comes into the restaurant, and it's me and Dan. He's sitting right next to me, and he comes to stand right in between us, doesn't say a word to us, <laughs> and just stands there just kind of like – but the reason why he couldn't say a word – you know, like those uh, sour straws or worms or whatever? He had a mouthful of them hanging out of his mouth like this. Oh, my God. <laughs> holding a, uh, a bang or rain energy drink like this. <laughs> mouthful, mouthful of sour straws and drink. <laughs> I don't know if he was trying to sell us his drink, if he wanted to show us some kind of character he's being. I, we didn't know. And we're like, what the hell? <laughs> I've never seen somebody like that ever in a restaurant. And then we followed up with the guy that we met at that other place. And uh, yeah, it was the 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 weirdos were out that night, man. <laughs> yeah, they were. It was a good time, though. 
That's great, man. All right, last thing uh, before I let you go. And uh, guys, make sure you go follow James at James Cruz on Instagram. Uh, Cruz is spelled C R U S E. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know. We've already we've already established your, your resume on being a champion. All these competitions, um, Food Network guy, uh, you know, uh, all the accolades. Uh, Stockyard Landing. Uh, he's got his own rubs, his own sauces. Go check that out for sure. Go to stock. Stockyardland, stockyardlanding.com stockyardlanding.com uh, mm-hmm. so with all that all that said uh, we already talked about the good food in Miami where's not barbecue you're not allowed to do you're not allowed to say barbecue uh, you got you got to take me to one place to eat in uh, New Orleans where are we going hmm Dude, that's tough we've got over 2,000 privately owned restaurants in the New Orleans area yeah, but you know stuff. Do you want? Do, do, a, it's like gum. Do you go gumbo? I, do you a, go ben, I, beignet? Uh, I'm a casual. I'm a casual guy. And if you want, if we want to talk home, true home for me, Arabia, Louisiana. I grew up a block and a half from the original Popeyes. Hey, Who might go to Popeyes? Didn't see that coming. The, the the very first ever Popeyes, but it's not there. It's not there anymore. But. I mean, dude, it's one of my favorite places in the entire world to eat. Uh, but look, we'll do this. We'll go have lunch there. And then let me think about a, uh, a restaurant. I'm friends with a bunch of chefs who own a bunch of restaurants who do a, lot of, do a lot of cool things. Some of them actually do some smoke elements yeah. inside of their, their food, inside of their menus. But uh, I'll get back to you on that. But as far as, as naming a place, dude, I, we have everything covered here. Um, we got everything from Cajun Creole to, to Italian to Spanish food to you know Man. Mexican food to whatever. We have it here. Um, I would say that I would say this. I mean, really, that's a question for your viewers. Do tell them to follow me. Send me a message. Hey, I'm coming to New Orleans. What's the best Cajun food place? And, yeah. and I'll help them out. Hard, hard um, to beat a good po boy, bro. Hard to beat a good po boy. Yeah, we got we got po boys everywhere. Uh, Parkway Taverns considered the best in the country. They do a lot of cool stuff there. Um, but here's the thing: they're really, really good. But you want to find the hole in the wall mom and pop places that they they're pulling a, the French bread out, probably putting it under an arm while they're cutting it. And then, you know, put some slow roasted roast beef on there, some shrimp or whatever, whatever yeah. you want on there. Well, a we couple, couple of years ago, I went to New Orleans for a bachelor party and we're checking into the hotel and we're trying to figure out where we're going to go eat. Like, um, it was for my, uh, my half brother and he's a big foodie and he wanted to just make the whole weekend about eating and drinking cocktails. Right. And, uh, we're trying to decide the first place to go. And I open up the curtain to look out and across the street from the hotel is a festival going on. So I call up the front desk and I go, what's going on across the street? They go, Oh, that's the fried chicken festival. And I was like, yeah. guys, I know where we're eating. <laughs> lunch every day (laughs) we ate so much fried chicken dave for you personally this is what we're gonna do when you come in town for hogs for the cause remember you got to white out your calendar and come on down done son you're in the you're in the heart of crawfish season we're going to a backyard crawfish boil not a restaurant we're going to a backyard crawfish boil and and you're gonna get messy you're gonna drink a beer you're gonna hang out with us sit at a table we cover the newspaper and that's where i'm taking you all right i love a good old-fashioned crawfish boil i'm in yeah, we have them every weekend. So uh, we'll we'll get some friends together. We'll boil some crawfish, and you know, as much as I want to support my local friends at barbecue restaurants or Cajun restaurants or whatever restaurants right here, we'll just support one of the local guys and go yeah. buy some some crawfish from them. We'll boil them ourselves, and uh, we'll get you involved. I get you involved with some guys that have won some big awards in the crawfish world. Well, we'll do we'll it all. We'll go to the we'll, we'll go to the barbecue bowl. restaurants, and we'll have a crawfish boil. There and, we go. And we'll go to Popeyes. <laughs> <laughs> we, definitely, we definitely go to Popeyes. Yeah. I don't care. I don't, dude. I don't care if we're going there. Go get a, a two piece spicy real quick, and, yeah. and uh, we're still gonna eat a couple hours later anyway. <laughs> Sounds great, buddy. Uh, James, I'll uh-huh. let you get out of the bugs, man. I know you've been sitting there for for a well, while now. We appreciate you. Oh, we're good. Bud. We're good. I, I'm, I'm gonna stand on this bench real quick. I want y'all to see the, the battlefield from up top. There it is. Hey right, guys, look. Welcome to New Orleans. Right outside of New Orleans, this is uh the Battle of New Orleans, the, the Shelma Battlefield, where the Battle of New Orleans was held, and and look. Um, you know, this is Memorial Day. We're, we're, you know, we're talking about, you know, people have have, have sacrificed themselves for us to have these opportunities for podcasts and everything. But also, when, um, you know, thank the guys currently serving, and, you know, are still have retired guys who have put their time in for us to do this as well. Amen, brother. Well said. Uh, happy Memorial Day, bud. All right, man. You too. Right. Later.